it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our host for this evening, my buddy, Gary Walker. I know what you're saying. Christ, how long is this guy going to talk? I'll tell you what, you YouTube fans just tap my head. Two minutes and a half, I can handle that. 40 years at WBGO, they call it legacy because you can't call someone old. <laughs> Long standing? No, I prefer legacy. 40 years tomorrow. What exactly does legacy mean? Well, for me, it means thousands upon thousands and thousands of hours of performances like this, of listening to music, and sharing music over the radio, most of the time with headphones. 40 years of headphones, man. These are shot. <laughs> That's right. I have trouble hearing when I read. Yeah. Imagine my surprise when I picked up this book and it spoke to me loud and clear about a guy that started in California, moved to New Orleans, through Memphis, back to Berkeley in the 60s. <laughs> that informed a whole lot, didn't it? That's right. He swirled, he bounced. He shared his impure thoughts. He's an author. He's a writer. He's a performer, obviously. And he's a professional comedian, too. Not like those jerks that take up time in your meetings at work. No, he's the real deal. And it's all right here in this book. I'm going to tell you, it's the best of a life. But it's also the test of a life. I highly recommend this book. This man, he's a miracle. Ask yourself, when was the last time you saw a miracle, let alone heard one? We're going to do both of those things tonight, and we're going to open this book, we're going to chat about it, and take a look and find out exactly what the determination and the persistence and the artistry involved brought Michael Wolf to this stage in New York City tonight. It's a fascinating story. So please, join me, and welcome, on the drums, Daryl Green. On the bass, Ben Allison. Ben Allison. And on that note, and so many more, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Michael Wolf.
Michael Wolf, it's great to see you again and again. Great to be seen, man. <laughs> That's all I got to say. That's right. Better to be seen than to be viewed, right? Yeah. <laughs> what was that opening piece that we heard? That was a tune I wrote uh, called Metairie. I originally uh, was in, from New Orleans, and it's a little area outside of New Orleans near the airport where some of my relatives live, Metairie. So I just wrote this song called the Metairie. That's it. That's a lot. So music, a big part of your life from the very beginning. But you had time to do other things too, didn't you? Like go to camp and hang out, right? I did, I did. Yeah, well, I, everything I, I kind of, I was into music from when I was about four years old. My father, had, uh, well, my father was an amateur musician. He was a doctor, but he had perfect pitch. And uh, he uh, got a, uh, we got a, a piano that had belonged to my grandmother sent to us in Memphis. And I just started getting into it then, man. So wherever I went, whether it was camp or whatever it was, I was trying to play the piano because I had Tourette syndrome. And I found that when I played the piano, everything cooled out and it was magical. It was like some kind of syrup went through my body and chilled me out. So when I went to this camp, well, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna have to bring somebody up to to yeah. read a little bit from my book about yeah, being in camp. That. Let's do that. So maybe my son, Alex Wolf, could come up here and read a little bit <laughs> about camp. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hello. Me, and, uh, me and Mike go way back. Um, He's, uh, he's asked me to read this little portion. Um, this is about him at camp um, and about when he first kissed a girl. So I'm gonna talk about um, details about her and um, her mouth and things like that. So that's what I'm gonna be doing. Oh, I thought I was supposed to just read in my head, um, but I'll do it. I'll do it out loud if that works for everybody. Um, one of the best things about Farview Ranch Camp was that everyone was so accepting of me. No one ever teased me about my Tourette's, tics, or even mentioned them, at least not to my face. Perhaps the habits were becoming less noticeable as I grew older, but I think they were less pronounced because of the environment I was in. We were all immersed in things that were new to most of us, chores related to the animals, swimming in a swimming hole, singing with 60 other people. Maybe the other kids didn't have time to think about teasing me, and I didn't have time to worry about it. The chore I signed up for for the first week was milking the cows. We had to bring them in from the fields early each morning, get them into the milking stalls, and then milk those babies. I learned quickly how to pull down their teats, one in each hand. It became fun and went fast when I started tapping my foot to get into a rhythm. One time, a cow didn't like how I was milking her, and she kicked me right in the leg, knocking the bucket out of milk in the process. That's when I learned to keep my head buried in the cow's thigh to keep her from kicking. Often, I'd, I'd sing some little melody while tapping my foot and milking, a, a jazzy little cow milking song I'd make up on the spot. It was fun and effective. The first talent show was on Friday. And by that time, I'd already made a ton of friends and was totally into the swing of camp and was ready to play. When my name was called, I was nervous and excited at the same time. I walked up to the piano, sat down, and started playing the blues in the key of G. I really didn't have a plan beyond improvising melodies with my right hand while playing simple chords with my left. When I finished, everyone clapped enthusiastically and I took a bow as a nice afterglow feeling washed over me. That night, my cabin mates and Don told me how good I'd sounded and what a good player I was. I loved that camp so much. I went back every year until I was 16, at which point I became a junior counselor and my parents received a discount on the price. I'd go for at least two weeks of summer, sometimes a month. I experienced a lot of things for the first time at Farview. My first fight, 
my first controversy over something I'd played, my first son, no, I'm just kidding, um, my first real kiss. I don't remember the girl's name, but I remember how she looked. She was about five foot four and willowy, with brown hair to the nape of her neck, pretty brown eyes, and a model's cheekbones. Her face was dusted with freckles, and she had beautiful soft lips. After the campfire one night, where we'd sat next to each other singing songs, I walked her down to her cabin. On the way, we took a little detour down a dirt road to the swimming hole. It was so quiet, it felt scary and quite thrilling. We were holding hands and not really talking much. We sat down on a log by the side of the road, and I gazed at her face, which was illuminated by a nice third quarter moon. And as she looked straight into my eyes, I was feeling very happy and electric. The air had cooled down and mosquitoes buzzed around us, harmonizing with the crickets down at the lake. I could even hear the lake lapping at the shore. I knew this was the perfect time to make a move, but I was nervous as hell. Before I could think too hard about it, I put my arm around her and kissed her. And she opened her mouth and I slipped my tongue inside, all slippery and silvery. I loved it. I could feel every cell of her mouth with, the mouth with every cell of my mouth and a chill traveled down my back to the base of my spine. It was the same feeling I get when music moves me to my core. All the tension left my body and I was pure and simple and no ticks like water rippling down a, a creek. I had never tasted or felt anything so good. Her tongue was like a minnow swimming around with mine. She'd been chewing gum so her mouth tasted and felt spearmint fresh and icy. It was as close I'd ever, ever gotten to that feeling of forming one central being from two. I was content to stay on that log with my tongue in that girl's mouth for the rest of my life. <laughs> okay, maybe I'd take a break now and then to eat or play piano, but after each meal or session, I would race right back to that log and that girl and that mouth and that tongue and live there forever. The summer of 1965 marked my third year at the camp. I was almost 14 at that point, and an old hand at the chores, activities, and talent shows. I loved the Beatles, and had learned a lot of their music on both guitar and piano. As usual, the counselors were cool, and most were into music. A couple of them and I put together a rendition of the Beatles' as Norwegian Wood, which had been a big hit that year. At the first week's talent show, the three of us sang it, um, sang it as the two counselors played guitars and I played piano. The whole camp knew the song and they loved it. At the end of the evening, we went back to the cabin stoked. The next morning after breakfast, one of the counselors came up to me and said we needed to talk. He and my counselor and I went for a walk and they told me that Chuck and Joy were unhappy that we'd perform Norwegian Wood as they thought it was too adult for the camp. They didn't specify which lyrics they didn't like and I was confused. I don't get it, I said. In the song, a guy hangs out with a girl, then goes up and sleeps in the bathtub. What's too adult about that? And anyway, I'm musically inclined. I don't even think about the lyrics. Musically inclined was an expression I'd heard and thought was impressive. To this day, I, I don't really know what the problem was. Maybe they thought Norwegian Wood was a euphemism for marijuana, but that's when I started to realize how much power music can have that aside from making people feel happy or dancey or sexy, it can rile people up, upset them, and make them uncomfortable. This made me dig it even more. You know, I love the attention to detail that your son described in those, those evenings at camp. Three-quarter moon? Yeah. Who remembers all that stuff? Uh, me. <laughs> Though maybe that, in retrospect, that might have been, not have been the right thing for my son to read about me, kissing another <laughs> woman other than his mother. But, you know, he didn't like to think about me kissing her either, so I don't think, it was, I think it's cool, man. But he did a great job, and I appreciated it, you know. I wanted him to read something about youth, you know. And, uh, yeah, detail, you know, I'll tell you, when I wrote this book, I'd never written a book. I'd written, you know, regular school stuff, and, you know, uh, read a lot. I read a lot. I mean, when I was so shy as a kid in my Tourette's and I felt, you know, lonely and I was into music and I was into reading so every night when I couldn't play, it was too loud or whatever, I just read. I read every novelist I could get my hand on. I was precocious, you know. I mean, you know, uh, all of Salinger, all of Fitzgerald, you know, uh, Norman Mailer, just whoever I could get, you know, Kurt Vonnegut, Tommy Lasorda, you know, all the great, all the great authors, you know. <laughs> but, um, but you know, I, I found when I started writing this thing, my f really what happened was the first 
my first goal was to write a how-to book of how to be a musician. So I wrote about 100 pages of you know, how to be a sideman, how to be a leader, how to be on TV. I tried all that. You know, I wrote about 100 pages. And then I looked at it, and I realized, man, I liked the stories and the digression more than I liked telling people how to do it. So then I threw those out, and I started writing. And it took me about two years of writing to kind of find my own voice. I wanted it to just sound more or less like me. But I didn't have to think back, like remember it. As I sat down there and started writing, things just came to me that I hadn't thought about since that time. So it was, it was an amazing experience. And what a career. I mean, we're talking about a guy that early on, Sonny Rollins, Cannonball Adderley, had a chance to play with some of his heroes as the musical director for the Arsenio Hall show. And and, and so much more, which is where he also met his wonderful wife. But also along with that precociousness was a downright arrogance, right? Yeah. Downright damn arrogance. You know, like you're a teenager working at Fantasy Records, you know, out, out in Berkeley, California. And, and he's like, you know, a runner walking down the studio halls one day and he opens the door and who does he see? Cal Jader. And he ends up appearing with Cal Jader, that was persistence, precociousness, and the arrogance to make it happen in the first place. You got a lot of musical memories from that time, don't you? Definitely. Yeah, I, I had seen Kyle when I was in, I went to college. I made it through two years, and uh, then I went on the road with Cal. But I had seen him play in college, and I was walking around fantasy, and I saw him. And in those days, I was totally uninhibited and, you know, cocky or whatever you want to call it. And I just walked in and said, hey, I'm Mike Wolf. I'm ready to play in your band. And he was like, oh, <laughs> cool, man. You know, I'm going to be playing at El Matador down the street, and uh, you can come sit in in, in the summer. And I forgot about it, and then I tried to go down. And when he came to town, and I wasn't 21, so I couldn't get in. So I went down every night, and then finally, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And Sunday, the, a really nice waitress snuck me in, and I sat in, and he said, come back next week. And, you know, that's how I got the gig. You know, it was just, yeah. Can you, can you play something from, from that era or something that, you know, that you remember that inspired I could. You? Ooh, well, well, maybe, you know, I think maybe Holly's going to come up and talk about it a little bit. Should we play it first? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and play it first. Okay. Holly, you come up and, and, and read okay, it. well, I actually like to play a tune that I wrote for Cal that was on my Bounce album called Bounce, and I took the Latin kind of jazz idea of the way I grew up in the Bay Area playing, and this is his tune, Bounce, that we did. Michael Wolf. <laughs> Thank you. 
Daryl Green, Ben Allison, Michael Wolf. We're at the Yamaha Studios in New York City, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome up here now to read a portion of Michael's book on that note from Redwood. Please welcome Miss Holly Hunter. Breathe, Mike. Breathe. That's the first thing Cal Jader, the great Latin jazz vibist, said to me when I joined his band at the age of 20. And he'd say it many more times after that. But his drummer, Dick Burke, nicknamed Sputnik due to his physical similarity to the Russian satellite, <laughs> was always saying, burn, bro. Remember McCoy. Remember Dolphy. When I played with Ted Carson, we took it out. Swing hard. Be free. The bassist John Hurd, my roommate on the road, played so hard and strong, and on top of the beat, I had to burn just to keep up. He and Dick played like a churning train engine. They had coal burning inside them, and I had to dig in every second to avoid getting left behind on the tracks. Their approach was more modern than Cal's. I was young and, and full of crazy, teretic energy when I joined Cal's band, and I wanted to, I wanted to try out everything I heard. I didn't appreciate how original Cal was. Man, when he dropped his arms on his vibraphone, he sounded like Cal Jader and nobody else. Smooth and gentle, yet rhythmic when he needed to be. Completely himself. He'd made his name by putting sophisticated jazz harmonies on Latin jazz beats. His rhythm section always included a conga player, but his real love was swinging, smooth, bluesy, and ballady jazz. He loved the playing of vivest Milt Jackson. When I played too many notes or played too intensely, that's when he'd turn to me on the bandstand and say, breathe, Mike, breathe. I was a hippie when I joined Cal's band. I'd met him while working at Fantasy Records in Berkeley, writing out lead sheets for rock bands that didn't know musical notation. My first night on the bandstand, I wore a work shirt, blue jeans with holes in the knees, and a gray pork pie hat. Hey, kid. Cal said to me during the first set, take off the hat, bebop's over. <laughs> I had just turned 20 and finished two years of college, first at UCLA and then at UC Berkeley. My suitcase for the road was a Safeway grocery bag. I didn't have a warm coat. I, I didn't give a shit how I looked. My wild, curly mane rested on my shoulders, and I had never shaved my crazy beard since high school. I was a hippie, a beatnik, a homeless-looking dude who lived only for music. The first gig I played with Cal came after my third week with the band. After having gotten my feet wet for two weeks at the Burning Flame in Tucson, we were gonna play the Monterey Jazz Festival's Latin Jam on the closing Sunday afternoon. Cal was on vibes, of course. Al McKibben on bass, Dick Burke on drums, Willie Bobo on timbales, Armando Peraza on congas, and Dizzy Gillespie and Clark Terry on trumpets. And there I was, 20 years old, <laughs> ah, playing piano in, in Fender Rhodes. And while we were playing, I, I, I thought, these old motherfuckers are lucky to have me on the bandstand. <laughs> I cranked up my wah-wah pedal and phase shifter and let that old-fashioned music have it. I understand now that I had no intention of honoring those guys or respecting them. I just wanted to kick their asses. What a gunslinger approach that was compared to the way young musicians behave now. It's always, you know, it's an honor to play with you, sir, <laughs> or sh some shit like that. That was not our approach. We came up in the 60s rebelling against any status quo. We were young and, and trying to change things. Looking back, maybe I thought the wild hair and the music would draw attention away from my Tourette's ticks and sounds. And being on the road with Dick and John helped with that. Uh, because Dick was a big fat guy and John had a serious stutter. So my habits were just part of the mix. <laughs> we teased one another harshly, but with acceptance. Man, even the conga player, Michael Smith, had a stutter and Cal drank his ass off. What a quintet we were. <laughs> but the driving force was music. We all, we loved and lived for the bandstand. Cal would always give us a, a, a trio feature where I'd play a tune with Dick and John. 
I remember a time when we were playing at the Double Tree Inn at SeaTac, the Seattle Tacoma Airport. I had chosen the exquisite song, My Funny Valentine is our trio number. I had only an electric piano, so I was, I was trying out this thing that Dick Burke had told me about. Dick said that when he played with Charles Mingus, they'd speed up and slow down the tempo on purpose throughout the song. So I played the melody, and we gradually sped up to where we were playing double time on the chord changes, twice as fast as the original tempo. As I launched into my solo, I caught a whiff of alcohol and felt a presence over my shoulder. It was Cal, and he whispered, Rogers and Hart just threw up on their graves. <laughs> For some reason, he also really hated when I used the term foul, as in asparagus is foul, man. Whenever he would play a solo that I thought was lame, I'd yell out, foul, and he'd throw mental daggers in my direction, but man, it cracked up Dick and John. When he finally had enough of my shit, he turned around and growled at me, one more foul and you're out. When I sent this to one of my cousins, her husband read it and said, man, you're a brave to write all that stuff in a book. <clears throat> but, that, you know, that's how it was when I was young, you know. I was, I was, I was out of control. But uh, music is what sent me out there, man. Uh, I, I, was, I was so lucky that I found my way, you know, and there was, it, it was a different time for jazz. So there were a lot of gigs and a lot of people that were out there touring. <clears throat> and I was able to have people that, now we would call them mentors. I didn't know that word mentor. I just thought they were people that I wanted to be like or I wanted to hang out with or gave me advice or told me stuff or gave me some shit or whatever it was. You know, that's the way it was when I was coming up. So I was really, really lucky to be in that time, really coming up as a musician in the 70s, uh, late 60s and 70s. So jazz was, it really was my saving grace for uh, having Tourette syndrome and feeling so shamed, ashamed of myself, and, and I, I didn't even get diagnosed until I was in my late 30s. I didn't know I had Tourette's syndrome. I just knew I did this weird stuff, and I'd never really met anybody that did. And you know, so when I found jazz and, and I found these guys, it was like that. Wow, they were as fucked up as I was, you know. So we we had we were a counterculture, and I felt like I was accepted. And if you could play, you were cool, you know. And I wasn't a cool person. <laughs> I was a kind of a nerdy, you know white kid, but I could play, and that's what got me going. You know, that's what got me, it, it saved me. It really saved me. You know, it, one of the legends that you had a chance, mentors, if you will, that you had a chance to work with, was Cannonball Adderley. In fact, you were part of his last recording. Yeah. And I'll bet at the time, you didn't know how powerful the word Phoenix was until you had to rise yourself, yeah. like the Phoenix later on. Uh, your time with Cannonball was was pretty exciting time, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I had, ha when I grew up, I had two idols, you know? I had Cannonball Adderley and Miles Davis were my two idols, so I was really, really happy that I uh, got that gig. And I got that gig was when I was in college, I played in a college big band and he was the guest and we just hit it off and I stayed in touch with him. And, uh, you know, I played with Cal, and then he came down to see me with Cal and was really impressed. And But he had a pianist at the time. So, you know, things just, I, I don't know how I did it, man. I didn't know anything about business. I didn't know anything about networking. There was no networking. There was no internet. There were no cell phones. There was no computer. It was just hanging out, man. Networking was hanging out, you know. Every night I would go out. where and When I was in the West Coast, I'd go out. When I moved to New York, I went out. And that's how I was on the scene and met, met Cannon and so. We have somebody here that's going to do a little reading, yes. and maybe I'll introduce him. One of my closest friends is here, and I, I asked him if he would be willing to uh, read uh, something also, and he said he is working today, but if he got off, he'd be willing to do it, and he did. So, Tony Shalhoub, would you come up and read? When I was 16... I went to the Berkeley Jazz Festival at the Greek Theater on the UC Berkeley campus with my high school girlfriend, Michelle. And we heard my idol, Cannonball Adderley, performing with his band. It was an amazing set. 
featuring Joe Zawano on Fender Rhodes, Nat Adderley, Cannonball's brother, and, and many others. Cannonball talked to the audience, and, and, and his large, warm personality radiated out into the crowd. If only I could play with that band, I said to Michelle. You will, Mike, she answered. One day, you will. You can imagine how proud I was when six years later, at the age of 22, I was playing the Greek theater with Cannonball Adderley. Backstage after our set, I told Cannon about seeing him that time and what my girlfriend had said to me. If only I could get back with Michelle, I mused. <laughs> You're on your own with that motherfucker, he shot back. Is that it, Mike? Keep going. <laughs> On one of our tours, we played out for about six weeks, including a couple of weeks at the Phoenix Playboy Club and a few weeks at Pioneer Bank in Seattle. Then we headed up to Montreal to play a jazz club in the Old Town section. We flew in from Seattle on our day off Monday and got settled into the hotel. The next day, around noon, we got ready to head over to the club to set up, perform a sound check, and rehearse a little. Cannon, Roy, and I went down and loaded Cannon's saxes and my electronic effects anvil case into the trunk of one of the rental cars, and just as we were getting in, we heard the squeal of tires. We were suddenly surrounded by cars that had come from all directions. A bunch of cops in blue uniforms jumped out with their guns drawn, pointed at our heads. Screaming into our stunned faces in French, they threw us up against our car and handcuffed us behind our backs. Whatever the hell they thought we'd done, these dudes weren't fucking around. They meant business. As we stole glances at one another, our eyes as big as saucers, the manager of the hotel came out. This will clear things up, I thought. Yeah, I'm glad you got these guys, he said. I knew they were up to no good. That's the Hilton for you. <laughs> we had no idea what was happening, but figured we'd better stay quiet and go along with them. They put Cannonball in the back of one car and threw Roy and me in the back of another, screaming the whole time and pushing our heads down. So we ended up sitting on the floor of the back seat. Then off we went at breakneck speed, silent and separated by a metal grate from the guys in the front seat. Eventually, we arrived at what looked like a police station and we were yanked out and shoved inside into some sort of admitting area. Hey, uh, can we get our one phone call? I managed to squeak. This isn't America, one of the cops, one of the cops growled at me. <laughs> You do not get a phone call. Oh, shit. They patted us down and took everything from our pockets, cash, wallets, keys, the works. Then they took us off in different directions. I was taken into the back and treated to a strip search, which included a careful look up my butt by some skeezy dude. After a while, a different guy came in. This one could speak English, and he explained that he was a Royal Canadian Mountie. Apparently, some guys had robbed a bank in the vicinity of our hotel, and we were the prime suspects. I explained that it was all a big mix-up. We were musicians with a gig at a nearby club. He listened quietly, then referring to the $586 they'd confiscated from my pocket. He asked me where I'd gotten so much money. We've been on the road for four weeks, I explained. That's the draw I took on my pay. You know, my walking around money. Honestly, man, we're just musicians. We we're booked for a week at the club in Old Town, and then it's straight back to New York. Seriously, call the club. They'll tell you all about it. He didn't respond to anything I said. He just peppered me with more questions about where I lived, who the other guys were, stuff like that. After a while, he left, and I sat there for 15 minutes or so until another Mountie came in and told me we were moving. 
pushing me in front of him, he took me even further into the bowels of the place toward a big door that looked like it was airlocked or something. This cannot be good, I thought. We were ushered inside the big door by another guy, and I found myself standing in a long hall lined on both sides with jail cells. Worse and worse. The cop took off my handcuffs, put me into a cell by myself, and threw in a brown paper bag after me. Without a word, he slammed the cell door, locked it, and walked away. Fuck this shit. I had never been in jail or even in custody. The cell had bunk beds with some really uncomfortable-looking green mats on them that resembled astroturf. I sat and then reclined on the bottom one. Sure enough, it felt like a bed of nails. I sat back up and examined my surroundings. Everything was gray metal, and the tiny box didn't exactly smell like a garden. On the ceiling, a previous occupant had carved some sort of profanity in French. I had a pretty good idea of what it meant. I opened up the brown bag and took out the driest, lamest, stiffest white bread sandwich ever made, filled with a single cardboard hard slice of yellowish cheese. I put that shit back in the bag and just sat there, hating my life. The way I figured it, Cannonball and Roy were very distinctive looking guys and would probably be let go, but me? With my crazy brown hair and big furry beard, I look like every French hippie dude in Montreal, possibly including one of the bank robbers they were looking for. These jive French motherfuckers could put me in jail for life without so much as a phone call or a good moist sandwich. <laughs> for, <laughs> God. For, for two hours, I sat in that cell thinking those dark thoughts until yet another blue uniform French-speaking dude showed up, unlocked the door, and led me out of there, this time without handcuffs. We got to the front of the place, I was handed back my stuff, and then ushered out to the parking lot. The guy opened the door of a car, gestured for me to get in. Roy was already sitting there, waiting. Once we were inside, no handles on our doors, I noticed, two cops got in the front, and we started driving. Roy and I looked at each other, but kept our mouths shut. Where were we going now? After around 20 minutes, I started recognizing things, and finally, we pulled into our hotel parking lot. The Mounties opened the doors for us, and once we climbed out, those cats just got back into their vehicle and drove off without a fucking word. <laughs> it had been a good five hours since we started loading up the car. Five hours of bullshit. Anyway, Roy and I were so fucking happy to be back at the hotel that we practically held hands and skipped up to our rooms. <laughs> when we got upstairs, we saw that Cannon's door was open, and he and Walter were hanging out. Cannon was lounging on his bed with a big Buddha smile on his face, <laughs> a torn brown bag on his lap, eating the fucking cheese sandwich he'd been given in jail. Not bad, my man, he said, smiling. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> On that note, it's from Redwood, and it's just a couple of the stories to give you a feel of what this man's life has, has, has been about. Wasn't all jail cells. He would go on, and luck would find him again. Persistence, precociousness, that arrogance. And he would wind up as the musical director for Miss Nancy Wilson for five years. Yeah. And they would travel the world, and he would learn how to arrange and play behind a singer, which is a, a gift unto itself. And he would also learn arranging for symphonies, and string quartets, and you will hear some of his work a little bit later tonight, but it was also a little-known comedian from Cleveland, Ohio, who opened the shows for Miss Nancy Wilson, and he said, you know, one day I'm going to have my own television show, Michael, and you're going to be my musical director. 
Michael said, yeah, okay, man. And he just kind of filed it away. Because <laughs> you don't dispel anything, it might turn out. Well, that man's name was Arsenio Hall. And Michael, for five years, would be his musical director, play with his heroes, meet his wife, have two sons. And he ain't done yet. <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I'd like to have Brooke come up and read. And uh, Tony himself will tell you it's his better half. And uh, they met doing some fine theater work. Ladies and gentlemen, Brooke Adams. When I was a kid, my dad loved Ray Charles. He and George Shearing were the blind guys I always asked dad to put on the record player. So when I found out that Ray was going to be a guest on our show, I was thrilled. He wanted to do a couple of songs with the band. Leon Russell's A Song for You and an original blues tune. We were sent sheet music to both and we rehearsed until we knew them well. On the day he was scheduled to arrive on set, we were instructed not to speak to Mr. Charles directly. What? I had worked with many of the greats and I knew it was imperative that I speak with him so we could back him well. As soon as he'd set up on stage, I went over and introduced myself to him. No worries, he was a groove. We discussed the two songs and then rehearsed them. They sounded great. The whole band was getting loose, hanging with Ray on the stage, the edict against speaking to him forgotten. He did keep drinking out of a thermos he'd brought, which I was later told was a mix of coffee and gin. But he seemed perfectly together to me. The assistant stage manager was clearly relieved to see how well things were going. After our rehearsal, he approached Ray. Mr. Charles, how would you like me to cue you to begin playing after we come back from commercial? Ray paused. Just do what you do with everybody else. What do you uh, usually do? I point. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I see what you mean. I see what you mean. We worked it out that the stage manager would cue me and I'd let Ray know by whispering to him, let's go. Worked like a charm. Ray had a reputation for laying into his band members while playing with them. I'd been on a bill with him as, at Avery Fisher Hall in New York while I was working for Nancy. After our set, I snuck out to the audience to listen to Ray and his big band. And sure enough, while he was singing in between phrases, he'd turn his head and yell at some poor guy who wasn't playing what Ray wanted. I'm not sure exactly who Ray's remarks were directed at, but I could tell they were blistering. Nothing like that happened during Arsenio, where I was pretty much in control, and visiting artists tended to be on their best behavior. Ray was a dream, no hassles, no criticism, just great playing and singing. I think Ray is hands down the greatest pop, soul, R&B, whatever, singer ever. As always, his voice moved me to my core, and being the great piano player he was, he coaxed that same soulful, bluesy style out of his keyboard. I'd been deeply influenced by Ray's piano playing as a kid, and there I was, playing my Fender Rhodes with him and loving every minute of it. A bonus was that after each song, Ray went over to sit on the couch with Arsenio and talked about his hits. Ray mentioned that Georgia on my mind had been his biggest and began singing it from way across the stage. I quickly found the key, which was G, and the whole band started playing with him. It was off the cuff and thrilling, one of the great spontaneous music moments of my life. There were quite a few moments like that on Arsenio's Hall show, but I've never seen them happen anywhere else. The night Sammy Davis Jr. was on, as I walked into his dressing room to say hello before the show, he was singing a song to himself. I recognized it as Jules Stein's classic, Time After Time. I told Sammy that when I was 12 years old, my father had taken me to see his midnight show at the Sands in Las Vegas, and that he'd blown my mind with his many talents. I decided then and there that I wanted to be in show business. Sammy laughed and said I should come by his house sometime so we could hang out. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, but I tried to stay cool. We chatted a little bit more before I excused myself and said I'd see him on stage. As I walked out of his dressing room, now a few feet off the ground, he continued singing time after time as he primped in the mirror. 
A few minutes later, Sammy came to the stage, and we rehearsed a bit where he danced to the groove of Michael Jackson's bad. Naturally, he was brilliant, and I was looking forward to the show. Arsenio was so taken with Sammy that he gave him several segments. During the second one, Sammy asked Arsenio, can I do a song with the guys, you know, just wing it? Sure, Arsenio replied, and the audience went wild as Sammy strolled toward the band. Of course, the cameramen were going crazy trying to set up the perfect shot of Sammy on our cramped bandstand. Time after time, Sammy whispered to me, what key? I don't know, baby, he said. Then Whisper sang the first phrase in my ear. It was in D. I started a vamp, John B. came in on the bass, Chuck added drums, and we were off to the races. I'd never played the song, so I listened hard for John's bass notes to make sure I hit the right chords. Peter added some Freddie Green quarter note guitar and a few well-placed fills, and we were sounding pretty good. Star, the youngest among us, had probably assumed we were going to play Cindy Lauper's time after time. <laughs> But she caught up quickly and added some nice sync, synth sounds. Sammy's singing was fantastic, so swinging and so in tune. He had total control of his voice and the music. We just followed his lead, caught up in the excitement of jumping in and playing something we'd never played before, on live TV in front of millions, no less. Man, that, was, that kind of high-wire act is the shit. Something similar happened when Patti LaBelle was on the show. But enough of that, we'll talk later. <laughs> you know what I find interesting about all of these readings about the theme running tonight is the improvisational nature of how things took place. Ray Charles with Arsenio Hall, Sammy Davis Jr. as well. But those kinds of things also inform another part of your life. And this is the part that almost took you from us. And that was a very rare form of cancer. And if it wasn't for the improvisational skills of your doctor, Dr. Gunder, Gounder, who's with us tonight. Would you please stand up? Please. Thank you. That man right there is the kind of man who makes miracles. Indeed, he did, because he took a, a very small pill, two milligrams, that was used to treat people with melanoma after it had metastasized, Nothing to do with the type of cancer that you had that was taking you away, away from us, and changing your attitude and your personality at the same time. And he tried this, and within 10 days, it went away. It went into remission. And then it went away, and the 300 cases that existed previous to that, now going forward, there's a cure for that type of cancer. That, my friend, is life's improvisation. Dr. Gonder, thank you again. Because you don't know, man, he writes about it. He writes about it in this book. And it literally changed his life. You know, he became very inward looking. It's hard to imagine a guy that can create like this would think about nothing else but himself. And the people around him catered to his every need, his every whim. And sometimes there was anger involved. But sometimes and many other times there was love involved. Just ask his sons who were there at his side many, many days and nights. His wife, Polly, who couldn't be here with us tonight because she hasn't quite forgiven him yet. <laughs> That's not true. Stop that man. But, but through all of this, like when you were in the throes of this, you went out and bought 
an incredibly expensive piano because you knew that through this, out of the ashes rises the phoenix. You were going to do all this again. And you did it again, right? Well, I didn't know, but my wife convinced me to do it. I said, I've never really had a good piano. And she said, and I had inherited some money when my mother passed away. She said, just do it, man. Because she wanted me to have a reason to get up, you know, because I was in bed for eight months. And, uh, well, you know, uh, so I got it and, you know, took a chance. It paid off, you know. So, yeah, I, 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 I would make myself get up and pad into the living room and play the piano just for a few minutes every day. But it gave me something to look forward to. Because I, I watched every episode of Friends, man. And that's, <laughs> you know what I mean? That was, I think it was 100 episodes or whatever. And that, uh, that made me want to live. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I would just have, you know, and I never could, I, I was on so many drugs, I could never really get through any episode of any show or, you know, uh, friends would come visit me. Some of my friends are here, Alex Foster, people that were there in those days, and Tony and Brooke and uh, Holly. And, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't stay awake if people came to visit me, man. I was just so out, so out of it. And, uh, uh, anyway, so I mean, I, I, I mean, Dr. Gounder, you know, he he said uh, he was just saying this tonight, and he said this to me many times. It was what he was doing was jazz, because I remember when he came up with this idea for this pill. I said, "What's the research?" He said, "Man, you're the research." <laughs> and you know, oh, that was I, I. He keeps telling me I had a lot to do with it. I, I was desperate. I would have done anything he said to do, and you know, it. Uh, I I didn't really. Uh, you know, I didn't really have any hope. And uh, later on, I, when I got better, I asked him, when you met me, oh, what did you think? I had a year or two. He said, you had tops three months left. <laughs> so I, I'm glad I didn't know that, you know. But, um, well, you know, when you go so through, through something like that, and then there was one night when I did die on the table in the ICU, and, you know, I just went through a, you know, uh, my advice is don't get cancer, by the way, because it's I, not that he'll be out of business, but he'll be cool, you know. But, but I mean, you know, it is a friend of another friend of mine who's an oncologist says, well, you know, it can be a gift. I go, yeah, cancer is a gift if you survive it. And uh, I, I did get so much out of it, so much appreciation for life. And for I remember I asked Dr. Gounder once, hey, do you, th you know, before we found this, and I do you think I could take this certain trip? He goes, you got to enjoy every second, man. And it's like my good friend Warren Zevon when he was dying of cancer and he was on Letterman and Letterman said, well, do you have any advice? And he said, enjoy every sandwich. So, I mean, that, I can't say that I can live every second and try to enjoy every second, you know, I'm still me. But my, my wife, <laughs> my wife seems to think that it's made a big difference as well as the 10 milligrams of Celexa I'm now on. <laughs> 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 She keeps wanting me to go higher on it. I think it's good enough, you know. <laughs> but, um, you know, I guess I'm an open book, you know. That's why I, 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 I started writing this book before I got sick, or that, that, that how-to book, and then I got into it, and then I got sick, and then I really had a reason. Uh, you know, I couldn't write when I was sick for about four years, but when I got better, I thought, I got to write this book. I got to ex you know, even if nobody buys it or reads it, I had to do it for me. I wanted to experience my life and make some sense out of it, and and maybe l if it helps anybody or you know whatever. You know, just I just wrote it. It was selfish. I just wanted to write it, and I hope some people get something out of it. You know, so the response has been great. I love I love being able to move people playing music. I've done that all my life, and I always felt so selfish about it because I love it so much. But every time I would play, people would come up and say how moved they were, and that would always surprise me. How, how could you be moved? I'm so moved by music. I love it so much, and the fact that people dig it is, is a bonus. And I feel the same about writing the book. You know, I hope people will dig it. You know, we'll get something out of it about, you know, overcoming m my Tourette's. And I have to say, I was so sick with cancer, my Tourette's went away for a few years because there was no room in my system for it. And I remember going one day to Dr. Gounder and after I've been treated, and he says, I, I can tell you're getting better. I said, how do you know? He said, your ticks are back, man. <laughs> oh, because that means I had some energy, you know? Anyway, so I just think that, you know, here I am with this life with these amazing children, my, my son Alex and uh, my other son Nat and my wife Polly, and, you know, it's, 
I don't mean to be sentimental, but I am sentimental. I can't help it. Fuck it, you know? <laughs> I didn't have that attitude, but, th but that's how I feel about life. So the, what I did learn, as much as I love music, the important things to me are the people who I love. And that's really something that, f that I got focused on, that I hadn't, I mean, I, of course, loved all these people, but for Holly and, and uh, Brooke and Tony and, and Alex to come here and read and for Dr. Gounder and Alex Foster and all, you know, all these people to come, that's what it's about for me, you know? That's what it's about for me. So thank you all for coming. I love you all. <laughs> We're not finished yet. You know, it's interesting, those comments, because my intern who's been working with me, Oliver, asked a, a very similar question about, you know, how do your surroundings inform the kind of music and vice versa, the kind of friends that you surround yourself with? And I think you've just answered that question, right? I guess so, yeah. I mean, I just, you know, well, I, I, I think it's, it's internal, you know, what you're doing as an artist. And I'm, I'm, I'm really affected, like I played with Daryl uh, this weekend uh, uh, with his wife uh, and Camille Thurman. We had a great weekend. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was so exciting to just uh, be influenced by other people. So I'm definitely, you know, influenced by other people, whoever I'm around. But I think as you get older, you try to unload the toxic people from your life because, you know, that it's, hard to, it's hard to fight it off. I mean, I like what Holly said to me the other day. We were talking. She said, well, you know, to be a good artist, you have to, you really have to be sensitive and have a screen door. But every now and then, you've got to make that a soundproof wooden door, you know? <laughs> and I really like that. You've got to sometimes protect yourself. But, yeah. So when I have people like Ben Allison, who I've been playing with, you know, Daryl Green, you, you know, Newcott, uh, Bonnie. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I can't wait. I can't wait for your next expedition. Yeah. The book is called, on that note, it's from Redwood Press. I highly recommend it. We've touched upon just a little bit tonight uh, to give you kind of a little feeling as to what this guy is all about. And, and it's for sale. You know? And it's for sale. That's right. And he'll sign them, too. Yeah, I'll sign them. And I want to one thing I do want to say is, if something is bothering your life, if you buy the book, it will improve, I promise. <laughs> So it's twenty dollars. If you really got something bother me, bother you, give me twenty-five because uh, <laughs> then I'll have some advice. You can ask me any question. I'm not a fortune teller, but I know all the secrets to life. Okay? It's just like Paul Peel, right? Read it and forget it. Yeah. That's the thing. Well, we're not going to forget uh, the inspiration that is inside the pages of those books, of that book. On that note, and we're going to end tonight with a special three-part suite yeah. that Michael has written. Uh, so he's gonna introduce the string players. The piece is called Pandemia. Pandemia. And it's inspired him to do a whole recording of string-surrounded pieces, right? Yeah. yeah, I've written music for a jazz piano tree and orchestra, but never for string quartet, and I did this, and I. I was lucky I got to play with the string quartet in January in, at the Drum, and I was just blown away. They're such wonderful musicians. And so, uh, yeah, I'm, I want to write more for string quartet. I mean, it's a pain in the ass. I got to sit down, and I wrote the old-fashioned way. I write with big pieces of paper and pencils, you know? Then I got to put it into the computer. But, but I, I really love to do it, on, and they're so ins these musicians are so inspiring. They make me want to go do more, so. Yeah, I'll bring them up. Uh, I'm just going to do their first names because I don't know them that well. But uh, Lynn is playing uh, a first violin. Machiko, second violin. Eddie, viola. Valeria, on cello. Sorry about the last names. I just couldn't pronounce yours again. I'm sorry. And of course, Ben Allison on the bass. <laughs> on the drums, Daryl Green. And Gary Walker, thank you for everything. So this is a piece I started before the pandemic, but I finished it during it. And uh, I wrote it, I wrote some of the individual musical pieces on the piano and wrote them out. And then I just decided to make a complete suite out of it. So it's in three parts. And uh, I just, 
I love certain classical musicians, you know, Ravel and I don't know, so many of them. But I just was inspired uh, by the Ravel Piano Concerto in G, the second movement. It's so beautiful. And uh, by Copeland's Clarinet Concerto, because Alex Foster and I are playing a lot of music where he plays soprano sax, but we play a lot of classical clarinet pieces. And I decided, well, I, you know, instead of ripping off, you know, Herbie Hancock, I'll just rip these guys off, you know, see what we could come up with. <laughs> but I never really, you know, I wanted to combine it with a jazz piano trio, my jazz piano playing. So that was, that's the attempt here. So this is Pandemia. Thank you. 
and Demia. Michael Wolf. All right, thanks to Daryl Green and Ben Allison. Our wonderful special guests, Holly Hunter, Brooke Adams, Tony Shalhoub, Alex Wolf. Dr. Gounder for making this night and many more possible. Thank you, sir. Gary Walker. Thank you. <laughs> How are you for that one? I want to thank Bonnie, Masha, and Aaron Ross from Yamaha for their hard work tonight. Rob Davidson, our videographer. Uh, from WBGO, Steve Williams and Stephen Smith. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, a must read, a page, a page turner, an oil burner. Stop, Gary. You sound like, John Boy, are you done with that book about that jazz guy? I, I, need, I need a little more oil, Dad. I'm almost to the end. A fascinating read, sir. On that note, Michael will be signing books in the back. Say hello, enjoy this book. You'll thank him me and everybody else in this room that you were here tonight, and then uh, each one reach one. I tell a friend about this fabulous book from Redwood Publishers. On that note, and on that note, I will say,